then in the Father and the Son of the Ghost, Amen. This um, Mass was in the Mass of yesterday, the Mass of the Baptism of our Lord of the Octave Day of Epiphany. I'm going to be back here again in New Hampshire. <coughs> and uh, a few considerations on this mysterious this time. In fact, today is the first day in the Novus Ordo Church, you go out the first day of ordinary time, the Novus Ordo Church, you know, so that now that uh, this, this is the very first day of quote unquote ordinary time for the modernists. And uh, so, but it's the, <clears throat> this is that the period after Epiphany just begins today, the period after Epiphany, and tomorrow will be the first day of the green vestments of the year, and the season after Epiphany. And this little season after Epiphany is a mysterious time, it always varies in length, very much like the season of Pentecost. <clears throat> but here are a few considerations of the absence of our Lord. At this time, <clears throat> you know that one of the great mysteries of Christmas, I was considering the other day, is that it is a season in which, look at the great ones of Christmas. We have the shepherds, and they see Christ. And after they see Christ, they hear the, the words of the angel, they hear the song of the angel, and Christ is there in the cave. And they go to the cave and they see the king is born. And they spread the word, the king is born. The Messiah is here. Three kings come from the Orient. And they adore him. And they give him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And they say, we have seen the king. An old man, Simeon and Anna, an old woman, rejoice that he came into the temple. And there is rejoicing amongst the shepherds, the singing of the angels, the St. Joseph of the Blessed Virgin, sanctify a cave that was, that was a place where God wished to be born. And then everyone leaves. When we arrive at this day, everyone is gone. Simeon has died. We know this because he said, Now dismiss thy servant according to thy word in peace. I only wanted to live to see this child. Now I've seen him. Let me die. And so very shortly after he <coughs> held Jesus Christ in his arms, he died. And he died the most holy of death, which is why we sing about his death every night in the office of Compline when we sing the words of, of uh, Simeon, who said, Nunc dimite servum tuum domine, secundum verbum tuum in pace. Now dismiss thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word in peace. I have held Christ, now let me die. Anna would have also died. But what about Israel? Israel, Christ is gone. He has fled with St. Joseph, he has fled with the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he is in Egypt, where he will be for seven years. The kings who were came three pagans. They became three saints. St. Caspar, St. Melchior, and St. Balthazar. And they're gone. They left. The shepherds were very happy and they heard about the angels. The king is going to be born. And they're all waiting for the king to show himself. But after a few days, soldiers come and kill the eldest boy of many of those shepherds. And there's death and bloodshed around his birth. And after his bloodshed, nothing is heard. They think the child escaped. Maybe he was one of the 500 that was killed. But so far as we know, we know all of them. We went through the names of all the 500. And they were 500 boys who were all from Bethlehem. From the families that were known. And so surely the child escaped. And these 500 were killed. And then he's gone. And there's silence. Silence for 12 years. That's a very long silence. And when we consider the, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we say that He is epiphany, His divine manifestation shall never change. God always shows Himself as God. And He always shows Himself in the same way. When He came as King and Lord, He showed Himself to shepherds, but not all shepherds, those shepherds that were awake that night. He showed Himself that this is the sacred city of Bethlehem. But let it not be considered sacred because it is the place of birth for this child is not born to be born. As Bishop Sheen says, I believe quoting St. Augustine, but he says, this is the only child who could not be born to have life. The only child that could not be born to be born. This child was born to die. 
Because He's God. God cannot be born to have life. We were born to have life. This child was not. And then it might be clear that this child was not born to have life. The birth of this child was marked by death. And it was marked by multiple deaths. The obvious death of the children, the boys, who were killed in His name. And the death of Jerusalem's faith. Because Jerusalem was dead. They heard that Jesus Christ had come and they had forgotten. And they, they even knew that he would be born in Bethlehem. They were even told by pagans that the star was here. But they say, but then he was gone. And the word spread. Word spread that is just exactly what's happened right now. What's happening to many souls and in, in the battle of our little resistance movement and the battle of the faith right now is very much like unto the battle of Christ who came to conquer Satan, and he will conquer him. He came to spread the faith of the entire world, and it shall be spread. He came that he might be known by all, and he shall be known by all. But what about right now? His own people said, oh yes, he was born a few weeks ago, but then King Herod went and killed a bunch of boys, and we've heard nothing of him. In fact, it's said exactly as in a recent note, sent by some of the faithful, former faithful to our people. It's a dead end. It's a whole thing is a dead end. We've heard this now multiple times in the last 40 years. Your movement of the Society of St. Pius X, it's a dead end. Your movement of tradition, it's a dead end. It's going nowhere. It has no future. It has no, no hope for the future. Where is it going to go? Where is the Pope's not behind you? The bishops are not behind you? You don't have a bishop. You don't have a future. The whole world is going along with the new mass. The first superior of the fraternity of St. Peter said in 1990, he was once my spiritual director in St. Mary's, Kansas. And uh, he became the superior, uh, the first superior, I mean, the first superior, the second superior. Father Busy was thrown out as the first superior. The second superior was a Frenchman. And he was made a superior. And what he said when he became superior, he one time speaking to priests in a priest meeting, because some of these priests told me about it, some of them former society priests, and he said, he said, look, the new mass is a fact. Deal with it. We're going to have it till the end of time. Learn to live with it. The superior of the fraternity of St. Peter. Now the Bishop Fillet tells us, the new mass is a fact. Vatican II is a fact. It's the world we live in. Live with it. We can't have tradition the way it was before. Christ is not going to have his victory like he did before. It's all a dead end. And consider those three kings. He's the king of kings that was born. He's the lord of lords that was born. What's he doing? I've heard he fled to Egypt. <clears throat> Some say he went to Egypt. But we don't know where he is. He hasn't performed any miracles. He hasn't done any great things. And what about Jerusalem? They were worried about him for a short time. But then they forgot him. <clears throat> Just like in our little movement, that's the coming of Christ, number 600 billion. He comes in souls like this. He comes to nations like this. He comes to kingdoms and civilizations. And he comes always in a divine and secret way. So that those who have faith, they will understand. Those who have faith, they will see through the silence. They will see through the emptiness. And those that do not, shall not. And Christ shall return. But the returning of Christ is quite a scary thing. Because when Christ returned, the one reason why the church so much loves and prefers Easter over Christmas. Easter is a day of total victory. And when Christ returns on Easter, he returns to his friends and he brings great rejoicing. But Christ returns at Christmas also. When he returns at Christmas, he will meet Caiaphas, who shall never rejoice. He will meet Judas, who shall only rejoice for a short time and then shall betray Christ and never rejoice again. He shall meet the Pharisees, whom he shall call the, the brood of vipers. He shall come back to the apostles, the sinner, Peter, who shall become Simon, who shall become Saint Peter. He shall come back to some, and they will be happy at his coming. 
To others, and they will be terrified at His coming. To others, they will be angry at His coming. To others, and they won't care about His coming. And some will repent, and some will not. And so it's a scary thing when Christ comes back. How is He going to come back? In this first coming of Christ, this is the coming of Christ in grace. The coming of Christ to each age. The coming of Christ in our civilization. Coming of Christ right now in the society of St. Pius X. So just recently, one of our former faithful sends a note of mockery to us. It's another note. Note number 2483 or something like that. Another note of mockery. You're a dead end. You're going nowhere. We have Mass over here at our local church. We have Mass over there at the local church. We've got the Latin Mass. You're not the only one with the Latin Mass. You don't need, all you need to do to go to Mass is fulfill your Sunday obligation anyway. You don't need to solve these, all the trappings of the politics of canon law and the politics of the church. You don't need all that. But our Lord Jesus Christ tells us what we need is one holy Roman Catholic faith outside of which there is no salvation, and without which there is no hope. And if someone has a Mass without that, then he has a bastard Mass. We don't have anything to do with that. If someone has any part of it, but not the whole, then we don't have it. And how many times in the past, Daniel stood alone, and he stood up at the age of 12, and he saw all the Jewish people who knew that Susanna was innocent. They were not ignorant. They felt sorry for her. And some were happy to see her go. Most felt sorry for her. But what can be done? The judges said that she's guilty. The judges condemned her. And the judges were the witnesses. There's nothing that can be done. It's a shame. Poor Susanna. Goodbye, Susanna. And so they sent her to death. And one boy stood up on a rock. And he changed everything. And this is the way Christ shows himself. Daniel stood up. David stood up. He went to a great battle. And on the great battle, what was the day of the battle when Christ came? It was the 40th day. And out came that disgusting giant for the 40th time. He didn't know it was the last. And he came out and he said, I am I spit upon your God. And I spit upon your cowardly Jewish soldiers. And he wisely did so because they were cowards. And he said, Where, which of you will come and fight me in single combat? And they saw his strength. And they saw his stature. He stood more than ten feet tall. His head was above the basketball rim. So you want to, if you want to fight him, go to plan B. But David didn't believe in plan B. He said, that man is against God. I will kill him before the morning is out. And so he did. God has not changed. He has not changed. What is the dead end, which we hear so much about? They have said 50 years ago, look, there's a new mass. There's a new church. They're tearing down the old basilicas. They're destroying the old stained glass windows. They're ripping out the statues. They're gone. Save a couple of them, but they're going to be gone forever. And look at our new beautiful Pizza Hut churches. Now Pizza Hut's changed its design. So now look at our new churches of all the new modern design. This is the future. But those churches after 40 years are already abandoned. Those churches after 50 years are already empty. And people are going back to see the old churches. And they say, I like the old churches. And they brick, 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 stop breaking some of the stained glass windows. And the fact is that the new church is dead. But when they said 50 years ago, there is no future in your Latin Mass. There is no future. It's past. It's dead. It's gone. We have evolved past that. And now they're saying the same thing in the Catholic tradition. And they're saying the same thing inside our little resistance movement. You've got to accept that the new Mass is still a Mass. It gives a little bit of grace. It's not as good as the old days, but at least it's something. And the new church, it's still a church. It gives something. Yes, it does. It gives billions of souls an easy path to hell. But it doesn't give what God wants. And look at what's happening. Families still falling apart. The world still turning away from God. 
the prophecy of the Blessed Virgin Mary still being fulfilled, that things are going to get worse until my great victory. And so Christ did come. He did come. And he spoke about this coming on Holy, on Holy Palm Sunday morning. He spoke about it. He stood on top of this mountain of Olivet. He looked down upon Jerusalem and he wept. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, thou that stonest them, and even most recently killed the priest, who is not mentioned in sacred scripture. It's one of the many uh, passages of sacred scripture which proves that Protestants are full of heresy when they deny tradition. Because the, 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 man, the one mentioned by our Lord there is the, the priest who was killed between the porch and the altar. The priest that Christ mentions is not recorded in the sacred scripture. Including the priest who is not recorded in the scripture, Christ says, who is killed between the porch and the altar. He was going to offer sacrifice. And you saw the priest going to offer sacrifice and you killed him between the porch and the altar. And so they've killed many priests. Many priests in the Old Testament and many more in the New Offering sacrifice to God and to, for the salvation of souls. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times have I visited you? That's a divine manifestation. How many times would I have gathered you under my wings? But thou wouldest not. Who is the dead end? The dead end is Obama. Crying because his girl didn't win. The dead end are all these modern pigs. The dead end are these modern rulers. The dead end are these modern enemies of God. The dead end is the bankers. The dead end is the modern armies. The dead end is anyone and everyone who stands for a false religion. Who stands for a false belief. And there are billions of them. And as long as they stay in the false religion, as long as they stay with a false belief, they are a dead end. And they shall be forever forgotten. Remember what it tells us in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, the Holy Ghost tells us something about the people that lived in the first 1,656 years of our world. According to the Holy Ghost, they were great heroes. Our heroes, Hercules, our heroes, so the, Her the heroes of, the, of this modern generation of the last 3,000 years, the great men of the last 2,000 years, the great warriors, Richard III, all the great warriors and all the great battlers of the last 2,000 years. Sacred Scripture says they were greater. They were much greater before the flood. And it says this was a time of giants. And they weren't just physical giants. They were giants of heart. Giants of war. Giants of passion. Giants of human endeavor. And how many names do we know? 0, 0.0. How many do we remember? None. Shall they ever be remembered? No. They shall be forgotten and have been forgotten forever. These giants of their time, these great athletes, far greater than Michael Jordan and Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, they were infinitely greater in all their ways, but they are forgotten. And they are forever forgotten because their way is a dead end. And so many times we hear from our faithful, where's your bishop? Who's behind you? How many people do you have? We have 1,500 people go to our masses. It's pathetic. And uh, they're pathetic. <laughs> the ones that go. But the fact is, we have, oh, we have so few people coming to our masses. And there are other priests throughout the world also going to a few sheep here and a few sheep there and a few sheep here and a few sheep there. But where is the future? The future is in the faith. And those three kings, when they walked away from Jerusalem, they remembered Christ and they never forgot Him. And when Joseph fled into Egypt, running away, he remembered Christ and he never forgot Him. And the Holy Mother also went into Egypt, but she knew it was a temporary journey to Egypt because her son would not die in Egypt. Her son was going to die in Jerusalem. Her son would not fight in Egypt. Her son was going to fight in Jerusalem. And her son would not rule in Egypt. Her son would rule in Jerusalem. And her son would rule forever. And she knew when she went on that journey to Egypt, it was a temporary trip. 
coming back for a permanent stay. She knew the prophecy of Daniel when Daniel said, there shall come a little stone, a very small stone, and it's going to hit the great statue of the great civilizations, and it's going to hit it in the feet. The civilization of gold, the civilization of silver, the civilization of bronze, and the civilization of iron mixed with lead, and the lead that turned to clay. And that stone is going to hit it at the feet, and it will crumble the entire statue of all civilizations. And the little pebble is going to grow into the greatest of all mountains, which shall not be removed. And Nebuchadnezzar was the one who had this dream. And Daniel told him, that was your dream. He said, yes, that was my dream. And this dream is, you are the kingdom of gold. Your kingdom is going to collapse. You'll be followed by a kingdom of silver. It shall also collapse. Followed by a kingdom of bronze, and it shall collapse. And a kingdom of iron, which is the Roman kingdom, which shall be mixed with lead, and it too shall collapse. And in the time of that kingdom, a little stone shall come, the smallest of pebbles, and it shall hit the foot of the statue and destroy it and grow into the greatest of mountains. And when St. Joseph was wandering into Egypt, and the three kings were wandering away, and Jerusalem had forgotten about Christ who had already come. Christ has already come. He's already announced his presence. Then he announced it quietly. This is the way that St. Thomas says Christ speaks in a low voice. And St. Ignatius reminds us that also, I'm here and I'm coming back. One thing we notice about serious warriors, we tell this to the young people. If you go into the inner city and you go and fight, when a guy says, I'm going to dunk your teeth out and I'm going to kick your head in and I'm going to punch you in the gut, the guy is harmless. <laughs> He's good with the mouth, but he's not a fighter. But a real fighter, a real warrior, speaks quietly. He just speaks seriously and quietly and says only once. And they forget what he says. And then their head is removed from their bodies. <laughs> and so our Lord Jesus Christ is a real warrior. He's not a fake warrior. He came in to fight war when he came to Jerusalem. When he came to Bethlehem the first time, only a few miles outside of Jerusalem is where Bethlehem is. It's in the greater metropolitan area of Jerusalem, we would call it nowadays. He was there, and he came to conquer. And he came as a warrior. The angels sang about him, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men who have good will. But those who do not have good will, they shall not have peace. It shall be taken from them. And right now, we are in a time of the silence. This is the normal time. The time of the silence. Do we believe in the time of the silence? When they say that we are a dead end? Or to get another young man, come, Father, I want to be a priest. Well, come to the seminary. Where's your bishop? I don't know. Come to the seminary. We'll figure it out later. Because we need the faith. We need young men who have faith. We need young men who are going to study their faith and put it in their hearts and put it in their blood. And Christ will come. He will provide a bishop. So long as we remain faithful to the faith and not to men, but to the faith. And this has happened many times in the history of our church. They say we are a dead end. There is no future with the resistance. It's all hopeless. We're all fighting each other. We've been fighting each other for 6,000 years. Read your history book. Okay. My first two brothers, it's reported they didn't get along very well. One's name was Cain, the other one was Abel. One of them ended up dead because one was angry. And ever since that day, brothers have fought each other. Ever since that day, man has turned against God. Ever since that day, man has forgotten God. Ever since that day, man has run away from God. Men is in that, and the men who are assigned by God to be the chosen people have despised the prophets and despised the priests and despised those sent by Him. And God came anyway. And He cannot be stopped and He will not be stopped. Cannot and will not. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God. And the day is not so different than 2,000 years ago. It isn't so different we think our times are so unique. It's like everyone says, Father, Father, I've got the most unique problem in the world. Really? Yeah, why don't we everybody say the problem simultaneously? <laughs> Everybody's problem is unique, 
Everybody's crisis is the greatest. Everybody's husband is the worst. Everybody's wife is the most irritating. Everybody's children are straight from hell or the holiest. <laughs> the best. The blue ribbon winners, the gold ribbon winners, they're all champions, except they don't all make the pros. But nonetheless, they're all champions, etc. Or they're all the worst. Everyone has all their unique problems. But in fact, the only one that understands the uniqueness of our nature is God himself. He made every grass different from another. Oh, they look very similar. He made us all different flowers in his garden. He's the only one that understands our uniqueness. And he's the only one that knows how to get deep into our souls and pull out something worthwhile from us. And make us into something that is truly human. He doesn't want us to just be divine. He made us to be men. And men have passions. We must have passions for Christ. Men have bodies. We must use our bodies for spreading His kingdom. We have hearts. We have minds. We have eyes. We have teeth. We have all manner of things. Use each one of them in order to spread His kingdom. And this way, we will become perfect in ourselves. And we are, our uniqueness will be brought forth. One of the great tragedies of sin is that sin makes everyone the same. Everyone identical. Everyone identical. That's why St. Augustine says... The householder, as we mentioned multiple times, the householder went into his uh, house to see the wedding feast. And there was one man who had not on wedding garments. Oh, there were thousands of people at the feast. These are the thousands of the saints. Each one has a different face. Each one has a different way. But there was only one man who had not on a wedding garment. And St. Jerome says this is because that man is the sinner and every sinner is the same. There are billions of sinners, but no matter how many they are, there is no variety in them. There are thousands and thousands of saints, but while there are fewer than the, than the enemies of God, each one is different. Each one has a different face. Each one has a different strength. Each one has a different beauty. They are not one saint identical to another. But the sinners are only one. And if we look at the math, Consider our army. Our army consists of saints. Our army consists of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our army consists of Saint Joseph. Our army consists of the angels of heaven. And our enemies consist of one robot. With a battery that's going dead. That's what's happening. That is what's happening. Just recently, for instance, one million, two million Muslims coming across the border into Europe. Refugees between the age of 18 and 30, all male. Somehow refugees from Syria, none of which speak Syrian language. But these 2 million refugees who were actually invaders from the Islam coming into Europe, they came in and they were starving. And they had no place to sleep. What's the first thing they asked for? Electricity to charge their cell phone. They don't need food. They don't need sleep. They need their cell phone. And so we are becoming more and more like machines. And the sinner becomes more and more like machines. He can live without food. He can live without sleep. He can live without anything the human beings used to consider important in the past. But he can't live without his technology. These are all signs that our culture is losing its individuality, losing its humanity, and becoming more and more empty. And so when we open our eyes, the eyes of faith, we see our enemies, our batteries going dead. They're becoming more identical one to another. They are getting weaker. Though they are great in number, or so it seems, they are a dead end. And when the enemies of God and our enemies come to us and say, you're a dead end in the resistance. You're a dead end in Catholic tradition. You're a dead end in the Catholic faith because the whole world has abandoned this faith. We don't think that way anymore. Get with it. The homosexuality is the way of the future. Multiple religions is the way of the future. Divorce is going to be with us until the end of time. And then we're going to have to accept abortion and birth control. And you're going to have to accept the new mass. And you're going to have to accept Vatican II. And you're going to have to accept all the false religions. You may have to accept them. But as a follower of Christ, I don't. We accept the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We accept His ways. We accept His doctrine. We accept His spirit. And by accepting that spirit, even if we have to flee to Egypt for a time, <clears throat> even if all His teaching is forgotten, He comes back. 
and he shall not be stopped in his return. And the king shall return again, and he shall return at the end of time with a trumpet. And he will come as lightning from the east unto the west, and all the earth shall hear the sound of the coming of our king and judge, and all the earth shall mourn. But those who are not of the earth, those who are of heaven, they shall rejoice and we must make sure that betwixt now and then, the day of that particular or general judgment, we make sure we are with him. And we have to have faith in the time of silence. Faith in the time of abandonment. Faith in the time when they say that we are a dead end. Faith in the time when they mock us. Let them mock. Let them say how failures we are. But we must have confidence in the truth which is the only future and the only thing that is not a dead end. Stay whole, stay whole in our faith. Don't play games with the gospel. Don't play games with the truth. And God will bless us. He will get us through somehow, as he has our ancestors for the last 6,000 years. <laughs> from the beginning of time until now. And from now until the end, God will still be God. And he will still protect those that know, love, and serve him in this world. And he'll make sure that we give him glory. And are able to be happy with him in the next. Jose, God bless you all. And in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>
In the Father, the Holy Ghost, Amen. So today, in the second Sunday of, of after Epiphany, we have we're in the beginning of the battle, beginning of the battle of the the grind of the year. And we have to prepare ourselves for the judgment of our Lord Jesus Christ. Prepare ourselves for His coming. It's going to come with a particular judgment. It's going to come with a general judgment. And we have to take the lessons of faith, and then we have to live by them. And here in this second Sunday after Epiphany, we consider the miracle of the marriage feast of Cana, which St. John makes clear in the Gospel is the very first miracle. It's the first miracle that our Lord performed, the miracle of the marriage feast of Cana. So He did not do miracles before this one. And this miracle was before His disciples. So he first he did a miracle before his disciples. On Holy Thursday night, before he would die, he would speak of the great victory that he was going to have over the devil before his disciples. And then he would go to battle. So he would reserve something special for his disciples. It also was perform other miracles for all. The first one for the disciples. And as St. Jerome points out also, he went back to the childhood of our Lord. He first appeared to the shepherds. And to Simeon, and to Anna, and to St. Joseph of the Blessed Virgin Mary, first to his friends, and the three kings who even came from afar, to them first, to his friends first. Then he notified all. <coughs> they spread the word to all. And then the others reacted by trying to put our Lord Jesus Christ to death. So he first does expose himself to his friends in a special way, and then he exposes himself to others. Showing also, among other things, that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, and God is present in many ways. His first presence is the presence of conservation and creation. He creates the world and holds it in existence. And He conserves it, makes it able to continue to stay in existence. That's one form of His presence. But He is also present in a special way in His friends, by the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And, and so He has several presences. And of course, the most sacred presence of his own body, his own blood, his own soul, his own divinity, of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, in the host, in the tabernacle. And so, and the presence of Christ in the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and then those that have the faith. But he is not in the same way present before all. He is everywhere. He is ruling all, all men and all things everywhere. But he is not always in the same way in each place. And hence he shows himself one way to his friends. And remember also that our Lord said in this prayer on Holy Thursday night, O Lord, I thank thee that thou hast not revealed thyself to the proud. So he does not have the same showing of himself to everyone. And today he is, is, he is going to hide himself from the enemies and show himself to the friends. So in any case, we're now in a time of a battle and then it's the battle of faith that we are in right now. And we have going on in this time of the battle, once again, the, the, uh, some renewed little bitty attacks here and there against our little movement of the resistance, fighting the faith. And uh, the, some of our former faithful writing back and to, to other ones and saying, well, why are you only going to the, to the mass of the resistance? There's other society masses here, other society masses there. All that matters is that you go to the Latin Mass. Because, as they, even one of the priests of the Resistance put in writing just a short time ago, in the, in the Spanish uh, website of the Non Posimus, that the faithful are not responsible. And when you go to Mass, your job is only to go to Mass on Sunday, says the priest. Your, mass is only, your job is only to go to Mass on Sunday, and you're not responsible for whether the priest is unakum, with the Pope, or nonanakum, not with the Pope. And whatever he personally holds at the Mass is his own personal problem. Also, another priest told me this, another priest of resistance told me this three years ago, or two years ago, 2014. When we had a priest meeting in France. He says, my Mass is my personal Mass. And whatever I believe, what I think is my problem, and not the problem of the Society of Pius X, and not the problem of the others. And that's the reason why, if you, you can go to one priest's mass, maybe not another priest's mass, or what matters is that you just simply go to mass. And so what's happening is that we're losing our simple understanding of the Catholic faith and what the saints have taught for the last 2,000 years consistently. And we're changing our beliefs. 
And St. Paul gave us one simple rule, which is the most important rule of our times. If we ourselves, or an angel from heaven, teach you something different than what we have already taught you, let him be anathema. And so now, priests are beginning to say, well, it doesn't matter what Mass you go to. It doesn't matter <clears throat> as long as you're just going to the Latin Mass. And what is that? The teaching of the end the teaching of the Eternity of St. Peter, the teaching of the Novus Ordo. All that matters is that you go to Mass. But that is not what Christ taught. St. John the Almsgiver said one th in the, in the, back in 700 AD, he said, My children, I would that you never take communion ever again in your lives. And that you take communion from the hands of a heretic. It is better for you to never take communion ever again in your life. That's what St. John the Almsgiver said. And so that we're forgetting these simple truths. What is it that makes us able to be pleasing to God? God made me to know Him, love Him, and serve Him in this world, so that I might be happy with Him in the next. And to know Him, love Him, and serve Him means I have to have the supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And faith is the first virtue. And then I have to live by faith. Sacred Scripture tells us the just man lives by faith. And so that faith is the first thing. And if I find that there is something other than the true faith, then I must let it be anathema and stay away from it. And what do we teach? What our fathers have always taught. There is only one truth. There is only one Catholic Church outside of which there is no salvation. There is only one true faith that we need in order to get to heaven. We need this true faith. Without it, we can't go to heaven. Everyone in the world needs that faith. And one thing we must remember in our movement, our little movement of the resistance against Vatican II and modernism and all the errors of the modern world, is that it is not a movement of a few souls. It is the continuation of the Holy Roman Catholic Church and the Catholic faith, and it is a necessity for every human being on earth to think as we think. It is a necessity of every human being on earth to believe that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. Every man on earth must accept the truth of the Catholic Church, must accept the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, must accept that He's the God and King of all, and that there is only one way to eternal salvation, and only one God, one King, one, one Father of us all, one Mother of God, one Holy Mother of the Church, one set of seven sacraments, one sacrifice, united under the one hand who is the Holy Father. And all must know this, and all must accept this, in order to go to heaven. And it's a matter of the utmost necessity that every human being on earth accept these things. And it's just a very grave problem when we start to find people of the Catholic faith who call themselves Catholic. And you will say they belong to Catholic tradition, who are followers of our ancestors, who say it doesn't matter what the priest thinks. When a priest is at the altar, he is offering a public sacrifice, and he is praying with the Pope, or he is not praying with the Pope. He is praying with the faith, or he is not praying with the faith. And he is, and he is publicly professing some faith. He's publicly professing either the Anglican faith, as an Anglican priest, not even a valid priest, or his orthodox faith with a false orthodox church, or some other false church, or he's professing the Catholic faith, or he's professing the modernist faith of Vatican II, the modernist faith of the new church. And so what, what faith is he professing? And that profession is public. It matters what his public profession is. It matters what he says and does at the altar. And this is what our ancestors have told us for the last 2,000 years. Now all of a sudden we say it doesn't matter anymore. Then what are we here for? We are here to help all souls get to the kingdom of heaven and spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is necessary for every soul on earth. And there have been many times in the history of the world where very few souls have responded to grace. There have been many times in the history of the church, in the Old and New Testaments, not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old, where the majority of souls have abandoned God and only a few remain faithful, like Daniel, or like David, or like Tobias. And so there have been many, many times, and, 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 and there have been few souls responding to the grace, it's the time of St. Athanasius, and in our own times, and the, the, it doesn't matter the number of those that respond to grace, it will never be zero, it will at least be a few, 
And our Lord Jesus Christ said, when I return, will there be any faith left? Of course there will be, but it will be few. But there will be few sometimes, more at other times. The numbers are not important. But what is important is that we, those who are holding the faith, whether it be few or many, are holding the one true faith, whole and entire. And it is said there is much confusion in the church today, much confusion in the world today. Well, that confusion is uh, because of our own personal looking at things without looking at things in the eyes of faith. But if we look at things in the way that our ancestors looked at things, if we look at things the way that St. Augustine and St. Jerome looked at things, look at things the way that our fathers looked at things, then it is more simple. Is there a different teaching? If there is a different teaching, it's not of God. As we mentioned in the earlier sermon, one simple example, babies. Babies. Many Catholics today believe that you shouldn't have as many babies as we used to have. You can have more quality time with three babies and five babies than you can have with 15 babies and 20 babies. And so you can take better care of them, give them a better education, give them a bigger house, and so on. So the modern man thinks. So it's better to have fewer babies, devoting more money and time to them than to more babies. What's the answer? The answer is quite simple. Is this, different, is this teaching different than our father's? Is this practice different than our fathers? We don't need to go into an argument <clears throat> about whether it's better or whether it's worse. The pros and the cons. What St. Paul told us is, is it different? So did our fathers have 15 and 20 children? What does sacred scripture say in the Psalms? Blessed are the children of a youthful father, and he, and, and he shall fill his quiver therewith. That's what it says in the Psalms. That's what David sang to a thousand years before Christ was born. That the youthful father shall fill his quiver with many children. And blessed is he that has many children. And may you see your children's children to the third and fourth generation. And may you have many children gathered around your bed at the time of death. And so sacred scripture speaks of many children. And we had many children in the Old Testament. Our fathers had many children in the New Testament. And then not, they did always have children, and they raised the children, whether it be in great poverty or in great wealth or in any manner in between. What about today's teaching? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it smart? Is it not smart? All that matters, one question, is it different? And it is different. Therefore, let it be anathema. It is not of God. And so it's easy. What about the other teachings? So this is the one that Father MacDonald speaks of with regard to Sedevicantism. Sedevicantism. Were there Sedevicantists in the church a hundred years ago? A thousand years ago? Two thousand years ago? What about in the Old Testament? Did they exist in the Old Testament? No, they didn't. Therefore, it's different. If it is different, let it be anathema. Have we had bad superiors in the past? Yes, we have. Have we had wicked kings and wicked popes and wicked bishops and wicked priests? We have had them all. And the church has survived them. And there have been saints. So when we can say that they're wicked, they're not, then this is different. Therefore, let it be anathema. And we find in our present battle and tradition, what did Archbishop of Lefebvre teach? He taught the same truth that the church has always taught. That there is only one other Roman Catholic Church outside of which there is no salvation. And ecumenism is different. Therefore, let it be anathema. Religious liberty is different. Therefore, let it be anathema. And now we find in Vatican II is different. Let it be anathema. The new Mass is different. Let it be anathema. It's different. Yes, it's ugly. Yes, it has lies in it. But we all don't need to go to all those details. We can do that sometimes for an apologetics course. But what do we do as Catholics? Is it the same as my father's? Is it the same as Christ taught? Is it the same as the saints? Or is it different? That's the simple question. And that's the sufficient question to answer. So we look at our present battle in the resistance. And they say, oh, they're fighting in the resistance. They're fighting in Catholic tradition. They're fighting in the society of St. Pius X. All right. Which is different? And which is the same? Which is teaching the same as our fathers? Which is teaching different than our fathers? 
which is teaching the same as yesterday, which is teaching different than yesterday. So that yesterday, for all Catholics of tradition, who are true Catholics, all recognize Vatican II is evil. Now it's not so evil. Therefore it's different. And that difference is wrong. Let it be anathema. The new Mass was intrinsically evil. Now it can give grace. Let it be anathema. And so <clears throat> the new Church and the new Mass, these things that are new and different, they, they, because they're new and different, what have they done? They have led one billion souls away from God. And now we say, oh, there's a lot of good inside of that different thing. No, there is not. So as the, the, the battle seems to get more complex, which one's the Pope? We've got Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. You've got two guys in white now. Pope Francis is the Pope, and the, the, now, and, uh, the uh, what do you call it, uh, Pope Benedict handed over the keys to him. Both are wicked. Both are trying to leave the souls away from God, but he's still the Pope. And so that, well, is there a different teaching? Is there, is there a different teaching in the church today? Let it be anathema. Is there a different teaching to the past? Let it be anathema. Is there a different way? Let it be anathema. That's the simple question. And, there is a, and, and we're finding the same priests and the same bishops in the Catholic tradition who said one thing yesterday, change in their teaching today. It has become different. And so we must remember that simple rule, that simple test. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and in Sekula. Yesterday, today, and forever. Until the end of the world of worlds, He will always be the same. His faith will always be the same. And also remember, and we've mentioned recently, at the end of the Christmas season, what happened? Christ came, and He showed Himself. Then came the test. He came to Herod, and he showed that he was there. He came to the, the shepherds, and to those in the, 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 the other, the, the, the three kings. He came to Bethlehem and Jerusalem. He showed himself. He came into the temple, and Simeon and Anna spoke about his glory. And then what did he do? He left. He went to Egypt. The three kings went off. The Simeon and Anna died. And the shepherds had their own sons killed. And they forgot. And there was a long period of 12 years before he would show himself again. And then another even longer period until he would be 30 years old before he would show himself again. And yet he was always God. And what did they say during that time? Well, we heard the, the Messiah came. There was a star. Then there was a big, uh, these three kings came with all this money and all these riches and all this glory. And then there were 500 boys killed. And they think that he got away and we've heard nothing. So it must be nothing about this king. Where is this king? Is he really the king? And he was forgotten. But he did not stop his work. And this is what's happening right now in the Catholic Church. Catholic tradition is forgotten. But it's still here. The Catholic teaching is forgotten, but it's still here. And Christ is coming back from Egypt. He is coming back, but he will not come back in the same way to everyone. When he comes back to the Pharisees, he will call them the brood of vipers. When he comes back to the apostles, he will turn them to God, but not all. He will come back and Judas shall die by hanging himself. He shall come back and Caiaphas shall turn away and die in despair. He shall come back and Pilate shall commit suicide like Judas. He shall come back and many shall say they believe in him and be cured by him. But then they shall turn away from him. Such as the nine lepers. And so he shall come back. And when he comes back, it's, we don't know who will respond well to his return. This is one reason why Easter is the greatest feast of rejoicing in the Catholic Church. Because when Christ comes back after Easter, He comes back with victory. He comes back the gates of heaven open. He comes back with perfect saints created. But when He comes back after Christmas, He runs away. He goes to Egypt. When He comes back, He will come back to every soul, but not in the same way. Some will see Him as judge. Some will be, will, 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 he will not respond to, such as Herod 
Herod will ask questions, not the present Herod, the evil one, but Herod the lesser. Herod, uh, he will ask. He will ask Christ many questions on Good Friday. And Christ will not answer him one single question. And so will be for many souls today. He will stand in the presence of wicked men. And they will ask him questions. And he will not answer that. But he will be there. So Christ is coming back. Now between the time that he goes away or appears to go away. And the time that he comes back. We must persevere in the faith. We're in that time right now. That's the reason why as we begin the season of Epiphany. Later on, also the season of Pentecost, we wear green vestments because green is a sign of the virtue of hope. And we must have a great confidence and a great virtue of hope to persevere through this period, through this grind, through this battle. And we must persevere with the same faith that we had in the beginning to be the same faith we have at the end. And the same charity we had in the beginning, the same we had at the end, except increased in intensity. <coughs> The same hope we had in the beginning, the same hope in the end, only stronger. And so it must be that way with us. And we have persevered through this present battle, and we will have the victory in the end. But now is the time of the grind. Now is the time of the test. Because we know not the day or the hour. Remember St. John the Baptist himself did not know that it was Christ. He did not recognize Him. He himself said, I didn't recognize him. That's what St. John the Baptist said. Our Lord came right before him. But the, the Spirit told me that the one the dove would descend upon, that is he. And so St. John the Baptist did not know that this was the day he would be Christ. But since he was every day doing his duty, every day preaching the baptism of penance, every day performing the truth, Every day living according to charity. Every day doing penance. Every day being a prophet. It didn't matter the day that Christ came. And so it must be for us. We have to be every day fulfilling our duty. Every day imitating our fathers. Every day doing what our ancestors have done. And then when Christ comes it won't matter. We'll be ready and we'll be in a state of peace. So in any case, the uh, it's a, Prepare for the, the coming of our Lord and persevere in the battle. And we'll close into that. And God bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> Amen. So today is the second Sunday after Epiphany. And the uh, good to be back here again in Hartford. In the Epistle <coughs> for the second Sunday after Epiphany, it's taken from St. Paul's of the Romans, chapter 12. <coughs> Brethren, <coughs> having different gifts according to the grace that is given us, either prophecy to be used according to the rule of faith, or ministry and ministering, or he that teacheth in doctrine, he that exhorteth in exhorting, he that giveth with simplicity, he that ruleth with carefulness, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let the love be without dissimulation, having that which is, uh, hating that which is evil, cleaving to that which is good, loving one another with charity of, of brotherhood, with honor, preventing one another, in carefulness, not slothful, in spirit, fervent, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, instant in prayer, communicating to the necessities of the saints, pursuing hospitality, bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that rejoice, weep with them that weep, being of one mind, one toward another, not minding high things, but condescending, consenting to the humble. And then the gospel, taken by the court and sing John chapter 2. <clears throat> At that time, there was a marriage feast in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the marriage. And the wine failing, the mother of Jesus saith to him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith to her, 
Woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother saith to the water, to the waiters, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three measures apiece. Jesus saith to them, Fill the water pots with water. <coughs> and they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, Draw out now, and carry to the chief steward of the feast. <coughs> and they carried it. <coughs> and when the chief steward had tasted the water, made wine, and knew not water, uh, knew not whence it was, but the waiters knew who had drawn the, the water, the chief steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man at first setteth forth the good wine, and then when men have well drunk, that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This the beginning of the miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Those are the words of today's holy gospel. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. <coughs> so today, on this second Sunday, after Epiphany, we begin the, the battlefield, and uh, the we're in the, the grind of the battle. We're where, for the first time, the see the color green, which is the signifies the virtue of hope. The virtue of hope, which we need to persevere for a long time in the battlefield. We're in the battlefield of preparing our souls for the general judgment, preparing our souls for the particular judgment, preparing the church to conquer the world over the kingdom of Satan, and we're in the, the battlefield. And in the battlefield, the virtue <clears throat> that must stand out is the virtue of hope. That we have to realize that God is going to bring the victory, and we have all these three virtues, faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is charity, the first is faith. But the virtue that's the glue that holds faith and charity together, that makes charity possible to persevere, and makes faith also persevere, is the virtue of hope. It's kind of the glue between faith and charity. And we have to have these, these three principles of the spiritual life, the three principles of our life, our faith, hope, and charity. They have to be the principle of everything that we do. And so we enter now into the battlefield, and we're as Catholics following Christ, we're in the battle for the long haul, we're not in a five-minute battle. We're in the battle for the long haul. And there'll be ups and downs in the battle, and there'll be many, long, it's a long-standing war that went from the beginning of time, when Adam was kicked out of the Garden of Paradise and fell to the, to the trap of the devil, until the very end of time, when the Antichrist shall come and shall be slain by God, and the Peter the second shall be the final pope and the final apostles, and Elias will come back to finish his work, and Enoch will come back to finish his work, <coughs> so that the work of the Old Testament has to be finished, the conversion of the Jews. The work of the New Testament has to be finished. And this is a long-term work. And the work of preserving our faith is a long-term work. And so <coughs> the devil knows this as well as God knows this, and so he is trying to take away our hope. He's trying to chew away at the citadel of the Catholic faith and the citadel of the church. And now in entering into the second Sunday after Epiphany, we begin the long-term battle. And it will continue throughout the entirety of the whole liturgical year and throughout the entirety of life. As we begin this long-term battle, we consider the most essential points. The first of which is, there was a marriage feast at Cana. And the mother of Jesus was there. That's the first thing. If we're going to persevere in a battle for the long haul, all that's necessary is the mother of Jesus is there. She must be there in our homes. She must be there in our daily rosaries, in our lives. She has to be there. She has to be there in our fight. And then particularly at the greatest moment of the fight, which will be at the very end, when we're fighting at the cross, because all that the Blessed Virgin Mary was at the cross was she was there, standing to the foot of the cross. And because she was there, Mary Magdalene was able to be a, become a saint. St. John was able to become a saint. 
and we and, and we are able to have fruit in our church because our, our Lord said to her, "Woman, behold thy son; son, behold thy mother." And so, just her presence. She just has to be present. And the devil knows this very well. And so one thing that he very slowly does, and patiently, over the last 500 years, especially in the church, and inside of our souls, is try to simply remove the Blessed Virgin from being there. That's one of the long-term goals of Satan. She is the one who's going to crush the head of his serpent. She's the one who's going to crush the head of the serpent. She defeats him, and no matter whatever tactics he uses... So he just, he just wants to remove her. That's one of his long-term goals. That's the great success of the demonic Protestant religion and the various Protestant sects. What makes it so successful in the kingdom of Satan and why so many souls have gone to hell through the administration of Martin Luther and John Calvin and all of the, 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 uh, the Protestant religions, Henry VIII and so on, is that they've removed the Blessed Virgin Mary from being there. And removing her from being there, they sucked the life out of Christianity and destroyed Christendom and brought about the whole of the heresy of modernism in the 20th century. So the first thing is, the mother of Jesus is there. And the first way to defeat Satan, make her there. And then there is a miracle of the marriage feast of Cana, which is brought out in the gospel today. And at the very end, and his disciples believed in him. And they knew things that the others didn't know. We see once again the secret divine manifestation. It's part of the feast of Christmas, the three miracles, the, the three kings coming. The three kings coming and seeing Christ. Christ going to the River Jordan. And when he arrives at the River Jordan, even, even St. John the Baptist did not recognize him. St. John the Baptist himself said, I did not recognize Christ. He was the great precursor. He didn't recognize him. But the angel told me, He whom you see the, the dove descend upon, that's he. And so St. John the Baptist was baptizing many thousands of men. And one man came in front of him whom he did not recognize. It was just another man to be baptized. And he was ready to baptize that man, and a dove descended upon him. And not recognizing that it was Christ, he recognized the dove. And then he said, this is the one, and I'm not worthy to baptize him. But of course, St. John the Baptist himself said, I will not recognize him. And he did not recognize him. And so, <clears throat> but then he saw the signs. He saw the signs, and when the sign came, he believed. And we see the signs of the coming of Christ in our times. And then, <coughs> so, and then, and then our Lord Jesus Christ performed the miracle. The third miracle of the Christmas season, which is the marriage feast of Cana. We read about it only in the Mass today, the second Sunday after Epiphany. But it is the, 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 the third miracle, the first miracle <coughs> that is recorded in the sacred scripture, and the first miracle that Christ performed, according to St. John. It was the first of the miracles that he performed. Many of the apocryphal gospels tell us that there were many other miracles that Christ performed before him, secret miracles. But according to the gospel of St. John, this was the first of his miracles. And he performed that miracle in the presence of his disciples, in order that they might believe. And these miracles, the miracle of turning water into wine, Christ gives us these little miracles all the time in the battle of fighting for him. Little bitty miracles, little bitty victories, little bitty uh, defenses of uh, where the, the, the world is trying to destroy us, and it fails. And we see many times the little miracles of Christ. And this first miracle Christ did before the disciples, the Archidraclinus, the chief steward, he didn't see the miracle, though he was the proof of it. He tasted the good wine. The, 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 the bridegroom did not know the miracle, but the servants knew and the disciples knew and they believed. So he performed a sacred miracle to show himself first to his apostles. <clears throat> Just like in the, when he was a little child, the angels sang first for the shepherds. And then he shows himself before all the others. Then he did his public miracles. But he'll first do the private miracles and then he will do the public miracles. He will do both. And right now, in our little battle of tradition, and that has been the case down the last 2,000 years, and even our little battle of the resistance, we see little bitty miracles, hidden miracles, that are coming from Christ to remind us, to give us encouragement that we must continue in the fight. And so, in any case, in this present stage of the battle, <coughs> we have to remind, remember that we're in a long-term battle. We're not in a short-term battle. And we have to be reminded of why we're here. It's quite simple, but why are we here? Just recently, in the last few days, 
We received yet another attack, which is another occasion <coughs> amongst our own, some of our own, saying, well, you know, why are you going to only the resistance mass? There's a local mass here, another local mass there, and, what, and we're even repeating the words, resistance to what? What are you resisting? What is the resistance resisting? It's really senseless, and the resistance is going nowhere. The resistance is going nowhere. It has no destination. It has no future. It's going nowhere. And so, <clears throat> the, the, so, they, so it's repeated again for the many thousands of times. But repeated again by some of our own people, <clears throat> some of our former parishioners. That, you know, there is, there's a resi what are you resisting? Resistance to what? There's a mass available nearby. Also, just recently, and even some of our, our uh, uh, priests in, in Mexico, see, in the, in the, in the non postal site, Father Tricado says, you can just, the purpose on Sunday is to, the faithful are not responsible for the priest. So you just go to Mass on Sunday, fulfill your Sunday obligation. And if the priest doesn't mention the Pope, that's his own personal problem. And if he does mention the Pope, that's his own personal problem. And so if he's unakum or non unakum, if he, whatever he is, all that matters is you fulfill your Sunday obligation. And so some of our priests are backing away from the fight, breathing tired. And we're forgetting the simple truth. Why are we here? St. Bernard of Clairvaux, used to remind himself very regularly. He would be in the monastery doing his work as a monk and, and he would ask himself, Bernarde, ad quid venisti. Bernarde, ad quid venisti. He would speak to himself in the third person. Bernard, for what have you come here? Why have you come? And he would remind himself why he came. We are here to know, love, and serve God in this world that, that we might give Him glory and then in the end we may be happy with Him in the next. In order to know, love, and serve Him in this world, the first and most necessary thing is faith. And this faith must be living. Therefore, it goes through hope and charity. And this becomes the principle of all our lives. Faith, hope, and charity. These three virtues which can never be separated one from another. But faith is the first one. And we're here for the faith. It's a faith that holds us together. And many souls again say, Father, there's new confusion, there's new confusion. Which one's the Pope, Benedict or Francis? What are we going to do about Cardinal Burke? And now he's got his Fisdubia. He's repeating the words of um, Archbishop Lefebvre in 1986 when he wrote to Paul, John Paul II, the Dubia. And so now Cardinal Burke writes to the, for Francis, the Dubia. He wants a clarification. And so he wants a clarification about some of the errors and heresies contained in the Amoris Laetitiae. And so now we've got Cardinal Burke talking about a dubious. We have uh, priests in the resistance speaking about Pope Francis being Pope and Pope, Pope uh, what do you call it, uh, Benedict being Pope. And then we have, <coughs> we have also the fact that all that matters is you go to Mass on Sunday. Would you, you, just, you just have a Catholic obligation to go to Mass on Sunday, so if the priest is unakum or non unakum, it doesn't matter. And these things, we say, cause confusion. But if we step back and simply look at our simple catechism, ad quid venisti, for what have you come here? Why are you here? Not why are you here in this, in this fire station for Mass. Why are you here on this earth? You are here on this earth in order to praise, reverence, and serve God our Lord. And by this means, to save your soul. And all other things were given to us to fulfill this purpose. And so God made all the other things. Principle and foundation number one in the Ignatian retreat. Principle and foundation number two in the Ignatian retreat. Which was not a principle and foundation of the retreat. It's just a catechism. And it's the nature of things. We're here to, for the faith. That's why we're here as human beings. We were created to know, love, and serve God. And St. Thomas Aquinas points out, all creatures are made for God's glory. Every creature. The dogs are made for His glory. The rocks are made for His glory. The angels are made for His glory. And men are made for His glory. The difference is how we give glory to God. All are made out of nothing. And we're made to give glory to God, but we give a different way. Rock gives glory to God by simply being hard and being a rock, living according to its nature. The dog gives glory to God by living according to his nature and by barking and doing what dogs do. And man is a rational animal. Man is a rational animal. Man is a political animal. Therefore, God, man must give, give glory to God politically and rationally. That's what makes us different from the other creatures. 
We must view with our minds, give glory to God, and also secondarily our bodies, because we are animals also. And we must politically give glory to God, because we belong in a society. We are society creatures. So in our, in our minds, in, in our society, we must give glory to God. Every human being on earth. Not just Catholics, not just traditional Catholics, not just traditional Catholics of the SSPX, not just traditional Catholics that are more traditional than the other traditional Catholics of the SSPX, and not just the resistance Catholics, and not just the true resistance Catholics against the fake resistance Catholics. Every human being on earth, every man, woman, and child as, that is created by God, whether it be a Jew or a Muslim or an atheist or a Protestant, or a Catholic, or any other religion, every human being on earth must praise, reverence, and serve God according to the command of God. And that means he must recognize that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. That he established the Holy Roman Catholic Church outside of which there is no salvation. That he will reward the just and the wicked. The just with eternal happiness, the wicked with eternal damnation. And everyone shall be under his judgment and no one shall escape his judgment. Not only the individuals, but all things. Such as the fig tree, which was judged by Christ because he was hungry. And when he wants figs, it doesn't matter if it's season or not. There better be figs, because God is God. And when he wants a fig, there better be a fig. And if the fig isn't there, the tree is judged. The rocks are judged. The stars are judged. And all human beings on earth are judged. Now every human being on earth must hold the Holy Roman Catholic faith, without which it's impossible to be saved. Unless one holds the whole faith, whole and inviolate, as St. Athanasius, the deacon, before he was even a priest, he wrote these words. And all Catholics follow the teaching of St. Athanasius. Inspired by the Holy Ghost, he wrote the Athanasian Creed, which was simply a repetition of what the apostles gave to us. And, the, and he repeated it, and it was put into the Council of Nicaea. And because he wrote that creed, the desire of the heretics was... Kill Athanasius, kill Athanasius, kill Athanasius. That's why they wanted him dead. Because he wrote that creed when he was still a deacon. He wasn't even a priest yet. And he wrote the creed, which is the creed of the, of the Athanasian creed. <clears throat> and that creed says, it is impossible for anyone to be saved unless he holds the Holy Roman Catholic faith whole and inviolate. That's why we're here in this firehouse. That's why we're here on this planet Earth. It is not only for us, but for every human being. Now, whoever holds a faith that is different than the one handed down to us is leading souls away from God and not of God. So what do we see? It doesn't matter what the difference is. If one says, for instance, that Jesus Christ is not God, he is not of God, such as the Muslims who say he's the son of God, but he is not God. And they lie. <laughs> and they deny His divinity. <clears throat> they are therefore enemies of God because they do not have the true faith. The Protestants deny the mother of God. And they deny the mystical body of Christ in the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And they deny the sacraments. And therefore they are not of God. It doesn't matter whether they deny many of the teachings of Christ or only one. Now we come to the present battle within the Catholic Church. What is that battle? It is the battle of, against modernism, which is the heresy of our times. And modernism teaches that truth evolves, that truth changes. And some are very modernist, and they accept every changed truth. Some are less modernist, and they accept only a few changed truths. But no truth changes. And to accept that any truth changes equals the heresy of modernism. Now we saw this in 2012. There's one simple example. When Father, uh, the, uh, the former superior of the seminary uh, uh, in, in, in Icone, <coughs> um, was a paratrooper. Uh, what was the name? Oh my goodness. It was a rector when my brother was there. But anyway, so that the... Uh, no, no, the, the, the former... Uh, anyway, the, <coughs> he was the former superior of the seminary in the late 80s. And, when, and so the, he wrote... He wrote a letter in France that says we cannot be Father Simulin. We cannot be 88ers. We cannot be 88ers. We are not an 88 anymore. 
We're no longer in 88. What was right in 88 is not right in 2012. So that the way to, to, to fight the situation in the church was different in 88 than it is in 2012. And therefore we have to see that it's a different situation requiring different, different weapons. Bishop Williamson tells us the same thing. He says that the situation is unprecedented in the history of the world. And that we've never been in a situation like this today. And it's a new situation requiring a new fight. So what was once the right way to fight in the past is no longer the right way to fight. What was once true in the past is no longer true. Now some accept only a small amount of truths can be changed. But if one truth is changed, then all truth is dead because there's only one truth. And therefore, if you change one truth, then all truth is dead. And so what do we do? Some modernists, the conservative modernists, they change only one truth. What do we do as Catholics? We hold what our ancestors taught whole and inviolate. It's called the deposit of the faith. Why do we call it the deposit of the faith? Because it cannot be changed. It cannot be added to and it cannot be diminished. It is the same faith that St. Peter handed down to us, that all the popes of the last 2,000 years handed down to us, that the bishops of the last 2,000 years handed down to us, that the priests and our fathers handed down to us down the last 2,000 years. That same faith cannot be changed. And so what do we discover now, for instance, when we, when, in our battle between the true resistance and the fake resistance? It's not a, the resistance is not new. It's simply the Catholic faith. Simply the Catholic teaching. And the fake resistance is not new either. It's just simply error and modernism under a new name. That's all it is. And so what is it that the new teaching is? Well, Vatican II used to be really, really bad now it's not so bad. The new mass used to be horrible. Now it's less horrible. It only has imperfect elements. And it can give grace and do good to the soul. And so what does St. Paul tell us? He gave us a simple rule. If we ourselves, that is St. Paul, or an angel from heaven, which means specifically a bishop because angel is messenger, but also means secondarily the angels themselves. An angel from heaven teach you something different than what we have already taught you. So you don't have to be a genius. You only have to know that there is something different being taught. So when we hear the teaching of the priests in the modern church, they tell us that we don't have to have the same amount of children we used to have in the past. We used to have children after children after children after children, but now we've learned so much that you need quality time with your kids. The reason why you're stupid is because your great-great-grandpa didn't have quality time with your great-grandpa. And so, but, but now we know that it's possible for you to be smart because you can have quality time with your kids. It's too late. You're already a moron. It's too late. And so the fact is, but we know now more. You need quality time with your children. We know more about the health of mothers. Mothers in the last 6,000 years, they used to just get married and have babies. Do it the good old-fashioned way. There was no housewife. Ask the local Indians. You cook breakfast, you go out in the woods, have a baby, come back and cook lunch. And it worked for a few thousand years. Wasn't really a problem. Our ancestors knew how to have babies. Our ancestors knew how to be married. Our ancestors knew how to raise children. And they weren't actually stupid. They had brains. Our ancestors knew what to teach the children. Are we going to teach them different? Then forget it. It doesn't have to be good or bad. It only has to be different. Are we going to teach our children different? We have many of our Catholic families, for instance, right now in Catholic tradition, they had 10 children. They had 12 children. They had 15 children. And they're telling their children don't have 15 children like we did. What are they saying? You were a mistake. We're in America. We have guns. Fix the mistake. Go to your gun closet, open the door, pick one, and fix the mistake. <laughs> Blow his brains out. So if your child was a mistake, fix it. Which one do you want to murder? We have our own, chill, our own parents inside of Catholic tradition telling their children, 
We had 15. We had one child after another. You can't have one child after another. Is that different? It makes a lot of sense because economically it makes sense. You know, you have to have money to have children. You have to have 5,000 vaccinations or at least child. You have to have so many different requirements. You have to have a different number. Nowadays, when you have a child, you've got to have, basically, you, you have to buy a bus just to carry the garbage necessary to carry the child. In India, they just wear their birthday suit, and it works fine. Here is necessary in order to have every single little thing. Special eight-wheel, 16-wheel drive uh, carts for pushing the children and all kinds of baggage and equipment. You have to have so many things to have a child. But that's not the way it is. Is it different than what our ancestors taught us? Let them be anathema. Is it different? Then it's wrong. We heard from Archbishop Lefebvre. We heard from, from the saints of the last 2,000 years. When someone does not hold the Catholic faith, even if they say the Catholic Mass, stay away. St. John the Almsgiver, in the year 700 A.D., he told his faithful 1,300 years ago, my children living in the East, I would that you never take communion ever again in your lives. Never take communion ever again in your lives rather than to take communion from the hands of the heretics. Remember, they only said the true Mass. There was no false Mass. Christ was truly present in the Blessed Sacrament in the Orthodox Mass, and He still is today. If you go to Russia, <coughs> Christ is in the tabernacle. If you go to the Orthodox, Christ is in the tabernacle. They are true and valid priests. They celebrate a true and valid Mass. Their Mass is identical to ours. And if you go to it, you commit a mortal sin. You commit a mortal sin. And if you go to communion also at that, you commit a second mortal sin, adding to your sacrilege. Because we must be united in the faith. This is our union. We learn this from St. John the Almsgiver in the year 700 A.D. We find it repeated again by St. Augustine before him. We find it repeated by St. John the Apostle, who says, do not even say hello to the heretics. We find it repeated again throughout all of the teaching of the last 2,000 years. And our ancestors, what did they do when they found out, for instance, in Hungary in the 1950s, that the priests who were Catholic priests, who were not teaching heresy, all they did was compromise with the communists. And in order to maintain peace, which is why they were called pox priests, these pox priests did not condemn communism. What did our ancestors do in Hungary only a few years ago? They refused to go to their masses. And they went to the masses of the priests in the underground. And the communists, the priests, who were not even communists, they were Catholic priests who simply were silent against communism. The communists did not throw them in prison. They searched for the priests, like Cardinal Menzenti, and they searched for the priests who refused to make peace with the communists, and they were executed, and they were thrown in prison. What did our ancestors do? Our situation is not that difficult to understand. We must teach the same faith that our ancestors taught, and we must repeat the actions of our ancestors. Down the last 2,000 years, is there a different teaching? Is there a different teaching? One of, the, one of the good statements, for instance, with regard to, say, the Vicondism, a very good and simple explanation by Father McDonald. Father Ed McDonald. Say the Vicondism is just another Vatican II novelty. That's all it is. There were no Say the Vicondists before 1970. 1,970 years ago, Christ was born. During the first 1,970 years, there were no state of incontinence in the church. There was no state of incontinence in the church. In 1970, state of incontinence entered the church after Vatican II. Therefore, it's just a Vatican II novelty. And we don't accept Vatican II novelties, whether they be the one about communion in the hand, or whether they be the one about the new teaching of ecumenism or sedificantism. It's a Vatican II novelty. Did our ancestors believe that they, they, that, there were no, that there were, they were not popes in the past? 
What about in the Old Testament when we had wicked leaders? Did they believe they were not leaders such as Caiaphas, such as King Saul when he turned against God, such as the wicked high priests, such as the wicked kings, and the many wicked popes of the last 2,000 years? And not just wicked, but popes in error, popes in heresy. And so, is it new? Then it's not of God. We don't take a new teaching. We don't accept a new teaching. We don't accept a different teaching. We follow our ancestors. And furthermore, what we do is not because we are traditional Catholics of the XSSPX, X uh, resistant movement, B, uh, W, you know, X, Y, whatever. We're just Catholics. Teaching what Catholics have taught for 2,000 years. And this isn't the first time in the history of our church, which is 6,000 years old. It isn't the first time that the majority of Catholics have wandered away from the truth. That the majority of followers of God have wandered away from the truth. The vast majority of bishops abandoned the truth in the time of Athanasius. The vast majority of all of the, of the, <clears throat> the followers <coughs> of Christ in England abandoned him. And only St. John Fisher remained faithful of the bishops in England in the time of Henry VIII. And, and it happened in the Old Testament the same way. The Jewish priests and the Jewish followers of God abandoned him and only Daniel was faithful. But what does sacred scripture say? Daniel, man of many desires, behold God looks at you and he hears your prayer. What about the prayer of all the others? He doesn't listen to their prayer. He listens to the prayer of Daniel. Because Daniel was holding the faith when the other Jews were rejecting it. And Daniel was a little boy in captivity. And then a prophet in captivity. And he died in old age. A great prophet. And so what do we do in our present situation? We remember in our long term battle. We are not in a battle of the resistance. We are in a battle for the salvation of all souls on earth. We are in the battle between heaven and hell. We are in the battle that is recorded in sacred scripture, in the gospel. The same battle. The same exact battle. And we are fighting against principalities and powers, like St. Paul told us 2,000 years ago. We are in this same fight. And we hold the same faith, whole and inviolate. And when we are a different faith, don't go into all the details. You know, maybe it's different, but they've got a good point because, you know, we've learned so much more in the modern age. That's the great heresy of modernism, the great heresy of evolution in our times. You know, we know more than we used to know. I've heard in priest meetings of several years ago, you know, we have to accept that modern medicine has discovered things that we didn't know before. I mean, Augustine was a pretty smart guy, but, you know, he was just Augustine. He was an African. What, you, what did he know? And then, you know, Thomas Aquinas, he had a weight problem. What did he know? And you have all these guys, all, all we look, all they, they weren't Alphonsus Liguri. What did he know? St. Pius V, what did he know? These are the great minds and great saints of history who know much more than the, the wisest of modern men and all modern men put together. These are the wise men of history. They know more. We follow what they teach. We follow what they taught. We don't need to follow a modern teaching. But what great, one of the effects of the great heresy of modernism is the general belief that we know more today than our ancestors. We've learned more about medicine. That's why everybody's so healthy today. Try to take a picture in 1123. Were there, were there 7 million, 700 million people overweight? Probably not. Everybody had to take medication. They need to take medication in order to stay alive. Do they have to seek counselors in order to be able to get through the daily life? They actually had a brain. They actually had health. They actually had strength. They didn't need the medicine that we have because they were healthier than us in body. They were smarter than us in mind. They were stronger than us in spirit. And they were greater than us in faith. They were better than us in every single way. But we are so stupid and ignorant that we believe we are better than them. We are not. Modern man is not better than ancient man. He said he lives longer. Have you ever seen anybody who's old nowadays? I'm living longer. I'm 162. I'm so much better than before. With your oxygen tank and, you, and with your air conditioning and you can't accomplish anything. When Frederick Hohenstaufen was 72 years old, what was he doing at 72? He was making something useful of his life. He was taking a sword and hacking Muslims in half. 
He was in the battlefield at the age of 72, hacking Muslims in half. He wasn't on an oxygen tank. He wasn't, he wasn't in a medication room. He was in the battlefield. And he died drowning, crossing a river, swimming. It was about the tenth river he crossed. And why did he drown? Because of his heavy armor and his sword. So at the age of 72, we can't do what they did before. Edward the Brack, Prince of Wales, was around the same age when he was hacking frogs. It's not very difficult to do. He was hacking French in little pieces. And so the fact is, they had more muscles, they had more brains, they had better everything, but we think that we are better. We're not. We're not. And so we must recognize that when something is different than what was taught before, it must be rejected. And so who do we follow? We follow whoever teaches the true faith. We don't follow the person because they're a person. We don't follow Bishop Fillet, Pope Francis, uh, you know, Bishop Williamson, Father Pfeiffer. We follow the truth. And when the priest or the bishop or the pope steps away from the holy truth, then we have to say no to them. And our ancestors told us what to do. They had wicked leaders. St. Joan of Arc never learned how to read. But she knew what to do in front of a wicked priest. When the wicked priest told her to lie, she said no. When the wicked priest tried to lead her away from God, she said no. When the wicked priest tried to get her to tell false things, she said the truth. And she died and was hung at the burn of the stake by wicked priests and wicked bishops in the Catholic Church. She knew what to do. And she never learned how to read. But she knew what to do. And so <clears throat> we also must do what Joan of Arc did. <clears throat> we have to stand for our holy Roman Catholic faith, which is unalterable. The new Mass, it is different than the Mass given to us by St. Peter. Therefore, let it be anathema. Vatican II is different than the councils given to us before, which are identical to the council of Jerusalem and, and, and recorded in the Scripture. Therefore, let Vatican II be anathema. St. Vicantism is different than what was taught before. Let it be anathema. All the modern teachings are different than what was taught before. Let them be anathema. And when we find that our own Bishop Fillet and our own Bishop Williamson and Bishop Tissier, our own four bishops, all four of them have decided to change. They were, they were told by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in June of 1988, hold your croziers, which is a weapon. Hold strong to your mitres and hold the Catholic truth until Rome converts until Rome comes back to the faith then take your croziers and take your and take 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 them and set them at the feet of the holy father but until that time hold it as a weapon and wage war because you are shepherds of the true faith shepherds that are supposed to be the followers of the shepherds of the last 2000 years and they have decided each one of them to change they have decided to be different let us not be different. We must hold the same faith and not be different. So when we look at our present battle in this litmus test, where do we stand? Do we stand in the same teaching as Athanasius in the Athanasian Creed? Good. Do we stand in the same stead of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, the great saint of our times, against modernism? Good. Do we stand in the same teaching as St. Thomas Aquinas? Do we stand in the same teaching of our ancestors? Good. And if it's different, then let it be anathema. And that's the rule of faith. And it has been many times in history that very few have stayed with the truth. It'll never be zero. But it has many times in history happened that very few. So we shouldn't be disturbed by the smallness of numbers. And we don't know all the souls in the world. We don't know how many souls are holding the faith. There are souls holding the faith everywhere in the world. God knows who they are. But we do know what the faith is. And that we must hold. And make sure the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ is there with us. And believe and see the secret protections that the Blessed Virgin and the Holy Ghost have given to us. And persevere in the faith until the end. And the victory of Mary, when it comes, will be found faithful in her army. And God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.